Holy Gospel according to John, the second chapter. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. So I know that you know that I like to ask questions. I also know that many of you like to ask questions. So we've been doing just that. We've been asking questions over these past many weeks. And so I said last week during that season of Epiphany in our worship, we asked ourselves, who is this guy, Jesus? What do all of those things from the Christmas story and the Epiphany story and his early ministry have to tell us about his humanity or his divinity or both? And why does that matter? Well, that exploration led us into the season of Lent where now last week I felt that we were drawn to another question. Who are we? As children of God who have been washed in the baptismal waters, who have been named and claimed by God and called to be faithful disciples of Jesus, having been urged to take up our crosses and follow, what does that mean for us? In this life that we've been called to live, who are we? Hopefully that got us digging a little bit and thinking about who we are as individuals because today I believe we're now called to think about who we are as a collective we, as the body of Christ, as the church. If Jesus walked through these doors on any given day as we gather for worship or for fellowship or meals or for work or service, would he look around here and say, yeah, this is what I want for my followers? Or would he take one look and get red in the face and start flipping over tables and chairs and pews and say, what are you doing? This isn't the church. Oh, wait a second. I have to get this straight. In the Old Testament reading, God has jealousy issues. And now in the, New, in the gospel reading, God and Jesus has anger issues. I mean, is that what we're hearing? In Exodus, we heard God say, you shall not bow down or, or to or worship other gods or idols, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I punish children for the iniquity of their parents, and on and on. And, and now, here's Jesus flipping over tables and clearing out the temple. What's going on? What always helps to know who God is so that we can know more about who we are. So, Let's dig into this gospel story a little. This cleansing of the temple story is, is one of those stories in the gospels that's actually recorded in all four gospels. But what's interesting about this one is that in those other three gospels where it's told, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus flipping over the tables and clearing the temple happens at the end of his ministry, just before he is arrested and sent to his death. It's almost like in those stories, this was the culmination of Jesus' ministry. Have you not heard or believed anything that I've said while I've been here with you? Come on! 
And this angry outburst is like that straw that broke the camel's back when it comes to those authorities being fed up with Jesus and wanting him to be stopped. And it's after he flips those tables and clears that temple that they start looking for him to arrest him. But when we hear this story today from John's gospel, this whole thing that Jesus does occurs at the beginning of his ministry. It's the only gospel to record it that way. All right, so what? Well, for John, this sets the stage for what Jesus' ministry is about. Stop making my father's house a marketplace is what he says to those as he's driving them away. Basically, the way they've been doing church, the way they've been conducting their temple worship is no longer going to be the way that it's done. Because you see, those things that Jesus was trying to stop in the temple were believed to be how faithful worship was conducted. Faithful Jewish people would come from far away to worship in this temple. And part of that faithful worship involved bringing an unblemished animal to offer as a sacrifice. So instead of bringing along their own animal for the journey and hoping it would arrive unblemished, let alone alive, there were sacrificial animals that were available for purchase upon arrival. But kind of like a hot dog at a stadium, it probably had a little bit of a markup on it. Because, I mean, where else would they buy such a thing? It's convenient for them. Oh, and don't forget, because they were in the temple, they they had to use the temple currency instead of any other currency that they would have brought from wherever they came from. But don't worry, there are money changers there who are happy to change your money to the temple currency. Just a slight markup, of course. So then you can purchase this required animal and you can do the worship in the required way and on and on. So yeah, Jesus is a little upset about this situation, taking advantage of people when they're just trying to come and do their due diligence in honoring and worshiping God. So in John's story, at the start of his ministry, Jesus is telling those people at the temple that there's a new temple in town. No longer do they have to go to this one place and purchase these prescribed items and and offer their worship and sacrifice in this certain way. No, their new center of worship, their new temple, is Jesus. Jesus' very own body is now the place where we encounter God. Through Jesus' physical incarnation, his birth among us, And through his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his sending of the Holy Spirit, we can now encounter and worship God in a whole new way. I mean, do we believe that? The people in the temple didn't believe it, and and they wanted proof. So Jesus makes them a promise. Destroy this temple, and I will rebuild it in three days. Unlike your temple, which has been under construction for, what, 46 years and and is still not complete? God, through Jesus, has transformed the way that we worship. God has transformed the ways in which we encounter God. And God has transformed the ways in which we experience grace. When God made his covenant with us, human beings through the Ten Commandments that were given on Mount Sinai, God showed us a new way of living. I mean, the Israelites knew there was something worth worshiping. They knew there was something that brought a greater meaning or purpose to who they were, but that idea of that meaning or purpose had strayed away from it being God. And it went to being other gods and idols that they have created for themselves. So God wanted to bring things back to focus Hey, you shall have no other gods. I alone am God. And in that, in the commands that follow, God shifts the focus on how we relate to God and to one another. So these commandments or these covenants help the Israelites to experience God's grace in a brand new way, as those commandments still do for us all today. So I think all that brings us back to that question we started with. Who are we as the gathered body of Christ, as the church? 
Are we making other things into our idols instead of fully focusing our worship and adoration on God? Are we cheating people who walk through these doors who are expecting a real experience of God? Are we taking advantage of their vulnerability for our self-gain? Or are we doing what God did through those commandments on Mount Sinai or what Jesus did in overturning the tables of the temple and offering a new living embodiment of God's grace to the world? I know we need a shake-up every now and then. We saw that in the Reformation that happened 500 years ago. Maybe we saw that again when we celebrated the anniversary of that Reformation a few months back. I mean, maybe that's what we should be thinking about as we approach our 100th anniversary of this church building so that we aren't worshiping this temple made of stone, but rather using this temple to worship a living God who showers grace upon us. Maybe this is why we're hearing these stories again during our season of Lent. It's our own opportunity to turn over our own tables, drive out the greed and the idol worship that we find ourselves trapped in, and once again be an expression of God's grace for ourselves and for those around us. I continue to hear our lament as we feel that we feel as though God is light years away from this world. The anger, the violence, the greed, the death that fills this world in our lives is, is just overwhelming. God seems nowhere to be found. And yet in the very next breath, we often still continue to confess that God is present and working and knowing and loving. Somewhere in between these things, something is missing. Maybe that disconnect is us. And the Holy Spirit, as Jesus promised before he ascended, is in us. And God is here, present and active. And we, you and me, are called to embody God's grace so that together, as the church, as the body of Christ, we can bring our own living and tangible form of God's love and grace, not only to ourselves and not only to one another when we, when we need it and when we ourselves feel overwhelmed, but also for the whole world. Thanks be to God. Amen.